Chapter twenty eight of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty eight The Reverend R. J. Campbell. Whether to friend or foe, the Reverend R. J. Campbell is one of the most arresting personalities in the London of our time. He is the voice of disquiet and of challenge. He is the disturber of our comfortable peace. He hurries with breathless eagerness from point to point the lighted torch ever in his hand, the trail of conflagration ever in his wake. He follows no lead except that of his own urgent, unquiet spirit. He is indifferent to consequences, will brook no interference, drive straight forward, deaf to appeals from the right hand or the left. Friends cannot persuade him, parties cannot hold him, creeds cannot limit him. He is like the wind that bloweth where it listeth if stagnation is death and discontent divine then he is one of the best assets of our time he flings his bombs into the stagnant parlors of our thought and thrills the air with the spirit of unrest acquiescence and content vanish at his challenge the sleeper rubs his eyes he is awake the vision is before him the air is filled with the murmur of many voices he too must be up and doing in the great dim industrial cities of the north where in the dark of the winter and the gray dawn of the summer mornings the women clothed in their shawls and clogs go forth to their labor in the mills there is a familiar figure he is known as the knocker-up at four o'clock the clatter of his clogs rings down the silent street and the thunder of his knock echoes from every door he passes and soon in the darkness there is the sound of a people awake doors bang and voices ring out on the still air and there follows the harsh music of a thousand clogs pattering in shrill chorus to the mills the battle of life has recommenced mr campbell is the knocker up in the dawn of the twentieth century the chimes of the great cathedral surge dreamful music on our slumbers but across from the city temple comes the sound of a bell violent clangorous insistent that shatters sleep and awakes the city you may not like it you may find it harsh and discordant but at least it makes you leap to your feet if only to take up its challenge nonconformity does not know what to make of this apparition that has suddenly burst into its midst it finds its throne as it were in the hands of the revolutionary it finds the old flags that waved from the keep hauled down and the twin flags of the new theology and socialism flying defiantly in the breeze it finds its doctrines vaporized into thin air diffused into a kind of purple mist beautiful but intangible it finds itself indicted in its own cathedral for the sin of Phariseeism, pictured to the world as Mrs. Oliphant loved to picture it, as a system of smug content, caricatured in the bitter sneer of Swift. We are God's chosen few, all others will be damned. There is no place in heaven for you, we can't have heaven crammed. It has borne the scourge with singular restraint. It knows that there has been a certain truth in the charge in the past it knows that there is less truth in it to-day than at any time since it was born out of the purging fires of persecution it has been the church of the middle classes but its future as sir compton rickett has said is with the people and it is to them that its appeal is directed to-day the work of men like f b meyer and john clifford sylvester horne and ensor walters campbell morgan and thomas phillips reflects the new spirit that has been breathed in these days into the dry bones of nonconformity. It is otherwise with the challenge to its faith. Here Mr. Campbell has done a real service. He has done the service to the religious world which Mr. Chamberlain did to the political world when he challenged the economic structure of the state. He was wrong, but he made us discover that we were right. He set the whole nation to think out the problem of its economic existence we had accepted the faith as final and had forgotten its very elements we were in servitude to a theory that we did not understand and did not want to understand he made us dig down to our foundations and see if they were true he put us on our defence and taught us our case 
and so free trade was born again it was a fetish it has become a faith this we owe to mr chamberlain and so with mr campbell he has challenged our religious structure at its centre and has set the mind of his time seething with unrest and inquiry he has lighted a fire which will burn up the refuse and leave the residue pure and vital he has made the man in the street think about ultimate things and no one can do a greater service to his time but says the divinity student think of the danger the danger to what asks the autocrat the danger to truth says the divinity student and the autocrat answers truth is tough you may kick it about all day like a football and it will be round and full like the moon at evening while error dies of the prick of a pen we need not worry about truth it comes out of the battle smoke unharmed leaving the lie dead upon the plain the churches needed this challenge they had ceased to face those obstinate questionings of the intellect which will not be stilled or if they are stilled are stilled only as the restless strivings of the fevered patient are stilled with the drugs of a deathly indifference the world has passed them by mr campbell has made them dig down to their foundations he has put them upon their defence and out of the dust and heat of the conflict it may be that faith will be born again it is not uncommon to hear him dismissed as a rather crude mind rushing in where wiser men fear to tread and fighting out his doubts in the public eye there is a certain truth in the criticism he is the ordinary man thinking furiously aloud he is the preacher wrestling with the plain man's doubts in the pulpit he is not so much fighting for the souls of his hearers as for his own soul and in that intense drama the man from the counting-house and the shop sees mirrored his own disquiet and his own hunger perhaps he too out of this conflict may catch a vision of the promised land it is this fact that makes him the most attractive pulpit personality of the day to those outside the churches the orthodox view him with coldness or alarm he shakes the pillars of the temple and brings the familiar fabric tumbling about their ears without providing another structure equally solid and secure to receive them he invites them out into the open in pursuit of the rainbow but to the soul adrift from the churches yet consumed with the hunger for more revelation that the world cannot provide the pursuit of the rainbow offers an emotion and a vision that stimulate if they do not satisfy this visionary fervor is expressed with unaffected sincerity and simplicity in the oratory of dr parker there was always a suggestion of the stage it was not that he was insincere but that the instinct of the drama was ineradicable he could not forget the limelight and loved the echoes of his own thunder mr campbell delivers himself up to his emotion with absolute self-surrender he goes out of himself as it were into space there is no strain either of thought or diction no effort after effect no flowers of speech he speaks as the spirit moves him without literary consciousness and without any thought of consequences it is not without spiritual relevance that the pulpit of the city temple used to be filled by an old man with a black mane and is now filled by a young man with a white for the leader of a great crusade he has one serious defect he is intensely sensitive to criticism he plays at bowls but does not look for rubbers he comes through as they say on the green with crashing force scattering the woods in his path and he seems surprised that the woods do not get out of the way with polite apologies for their presence they don't burn you at the stake to-day he said not long ago they stab you in the back few men have invited reprisals more few men have been treated with more generosity by those who find their beliefs their errors if you will suddenly and furiously assailed from within he has another defect it is a certain feverishness of the spirit there is about him the sense of the hot uneasy pillow the raw edges of life chafe him he cannot escape from the hair shirt of this mortal vestment and he cannot endure it whatever is is wrong the churches are wrong society is wrong free trade is wrong 
it is this irritation with his environment that gives him the touch of perversity which is so noticeable in him nonconformity is definite he is mystical nonconformity is individualistic he is a member of the i l p the i l p is for free trade he i gather from a conversation i had with him is for tariff reform he conforms to no system accepts no shibboleth either spiritual or temporal when sir david baird's mother heard that her son was captured in india and chained to natives she remarked placidly i pity the poor laddies that are chained to oor david she knew the imperious waywardness of her son the way of one chained intellectually to mr campbell would be not less trying he has the impatience of the idealist in the presence of realities the vision fades when he touches it concretely now as lowell says now ain't just the minute that ever fits us easy while we're in it the son of a united methodist minister brought up in the presbyterian atmosphere of his grandfather's home at belfast he turned instinctively from the appeal of nonconformity with its lack of sensuous attraction to that of anglicanism with its sense of historic continuity in the conflict between loyalty to the free church traditions of his ancestry and the call of a more aesthetic system his mind turned away from the pulpit he married and took up the teaching profession then with the impulsiveness that always drives him he set out for oxford his mind still under the influence of anglicanism but the atmosphere of oxford was anglican and that fact so subversive of the nonconformity of the normal man headed him back to the original fold it was not lack of sympathy for the singular charm of his personality made a deep impression on dr paget and dr gore was especially anxious to secure so powerful a recruit for the church it was the instinct of the nomadic spirit to escape from the encompassing fold it was the operation of what the psychologists called contrariant ideas the one way to prevent him going in a given direction is to urge him to go the one way to enlist him in a cause is to prove that it is contrary to all tradition and propriety when men reflect upon mr campbell's astonishing career one question rises to their lips whither there is no answer i question whether mr campbell himself has an answer he belongs to no planetary system he is a lonely wanderer through space a trail of fire burning at white heat and flashing through the inscrutable night to its unknown goal his head grey in his youth his eyes eloquent with some nameless hunger his face thin and pallid his physique frail as that of an aesthetic of the desert he stands before us a figure of singular fascination and disquiet a symbol of the world's passionate yearning after the dimly apprehended ideal of its unquenchable revolt against the agonies of men End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine the speaker when murray complained to byron that some of his poetry was dull byron replied you can no more have poetry all gems than a midnight all stars so it is with the house of commons ordinarily it is a very dull place there is a general air of lassitude and weariness the benches are thinly peopled with men who seem tired of each other's company they lounge about in every attitude of negligent inattention some one is droning away on a back bench but he is unheard amid the babble of idle conversation for though you may not read a book or a paper in the house you may chatter as fluently as a parakeet at the zoo superficially it is a gathering of the comfortable unemployed waiting for something to turn up occasionally something does turn up and then the house leaps to life as if by magic it has moments more dramatic more intense than any stage there was such a moment one afternoon in nineteen o three mr chamberlain had just flung his bomb into the astonished country and the house was reeling and reverberating with the concussion 
it was as though the familiar continent of politics had been engulfed by the sea and all the submerged politicians were struggling to find a footing in the new one that had suddenly come from the depths on this afternoon the air was electric with a suppressed excitement the benches crowded the faces of men flushed and expectant most flushed of all was the swarthy face of mr ritchie chancellor of the exchequer he had come down to deliver his soul a plain bluff honest man conscious of the keen unnerving presence of the bomb-thrower in the corner seat behind a question was put no said courtly mr speaker gully the general fiscal question could not under the rules be discussed it was as though a cold douche had suddenly descended from the ceiling the drama then was to be strangled by red tape mr ritchie moves from his seat along the front bench whispers to the chair gesticulates to the chair a moment later the prim clean-shaven lawyer quietly retires and a jovial-looking country gentleman ruddy and bearded takes his place and when mr ritchie rises to speak and plunges boldly into the fiscal question there is not a murmur of rebuke from the chair when he sits down mr speaker returns with his red tape and the house subsides into the atmosphere of formality that he loves the incident illustrates the difference between mr speaker lowther and his predecessor under mr gully the house lived in a straight waistcoat of legal technicality it crackled with parchment it was cribbed cabined and confined its air was the air of a lawyer's office and blackstone sat heavy upon its chest it was a dry arid place when mr lowther succeeded to the chair he opened the windows and let in the fresh air he came bringing a jolly breeze with him from the country it is true that he wears a wig and knee breeches and silver buckles on his shoes but all that is make-believe in his pocket you suspect there is a pipe and you feel convinced that he has just come from tramping the moors in very thick boots with a gun and a dog for company or if that is impossible then he has been having half an hour at the nets at lord's or a little sword practice with his maitre d'armes for he is still young enough to enjoy the matchless sensation of a late cut and the swift pleasure of the foils the fact probably is that he has been stewing since nine o'clock over the orders of the day and the way he shall parry the strokes of those terrible irishmen whose wits are swords but i speak of the impression he conveys it is the impression of the fresh air and the sunshine of league-long furrows and of the open sky on the rolling moor he seems to be a casual presence in this dim chamber he has strolled in at a moment of aberration and has taken the seat nearest at hand a cheerful bucolic man sound in wind and limb digestion excellent brain clear and cool temper unruffled the speaker stamps his own personality inevitably upon the house if he is acrid the temper of the house will be acrid if he is stiff and formal the house will be stiff and formal if he is jolly the house will be jolly to-day it is jolly mr peel ruled by awe mr gully by law mr lowther rules by a certain bluff common sense and good humour which communicate themselves to the members he makes them feel at home he is one of themselves it is not a chill rebuking figure that sits up there in wig and gown ready to pounce on you and send you to the clock tower it is a man and a brother if he raps you across the knuckles he does it with so much geniality that you feel that you ought to thank him he kicks you downstairs with such infinite grace you might think he was handing you up grace is perhaps not the word for that heavy voice and solid manner it is rather the hearty good will of a jovial companion who really loves you in spite of your frailties and scourges you for your own good even when he came down with such a heavy hand on sir howard vincent that garrulous knight was able to share the enjoyment of the house the question was the deportation of lajpat rai and sir howard interpolated sotto voce why not shoot him lo though it was spoken it did not escape the terrible ear of mr swift mcneil the watchdog of the parliamentary proprieties mr speaker and the whispered words were boomed out on the ears of the indignant house i was only speaking to myself said the discomfited sir howard 
the observation did not reach my ears said the speaker that is all i am prepared to say as to that i should like to add this that if the honourable and gallant member for sheffield would control the observations which he is always interjecting not only during question time but during debate it would be to the general advantage of the house it was severe it was just and it was kindly said that is the special grace of the speaker he is the antithesis of the gentleman in the song of whom it is said that it is not so much the things he says as the nasty way he says them he says unpleasant things in a pleasant way he is at his best when the waves run highest then he is like oil on the troubled waters take that memorable afternoon when the militant suffragist stormed the ladies gallery which is over the chair and invisible to the speaker and flourished their banners with the legend votes for women in the face of the astonished house there followed a sound of scuffling and disorder behind the grill which effectually screens the ladies from the vision of the members every one knew what it meant the police were dislodging the invaders instantly the storm reacted on the house brave hearts below answered to the cry of distress from above there were girls in the gold reef city and mr willie redmond was not the man to hear their cry of agony unmoved up he sprang like a knight of old romance mr speaker sir is it in accordance with your will that a barbarous police should be called in to assault our wives and daughters and his voice shook with chivalrous passion it was a great moment the house was rent with the passion of a sudden issue forked lightnings flashed about the chamber anything might happen there was a breathless pause what would the speaker say would he defend the police would he denounce the women would he whatever happened the storm must break unfortunately said the speaker rising with great solemnity i seem to be the only member of the house who is unable to see what is taking place and he looked up pathetically at the canopy that overhangs his chair the tension broke in a roar of universal laughter and the storm passed in summer lightnings there will never be a fight on the floor of the house while mr lowther is in the chair i do not know what the quality of his fencing which he practises twice a week with his french maitre d'armes is but i should imagine that if he has less gallic swiftness than sir charles dilke who is the swordsman of the house he is nevertheless a difficult man to disarm for he never loses his head and he never loses his temper the harder he is pressed the cooler he becomes a duel between him and mr tim healy the maitre d'armes of political fencing is the greatest luxury the house affords the thrusts of mr tim are sudden as lightning flashing now from that region of the sky and now from this you look to see whether the stroke has fallen ajax in his full-bottomed wig stands solid and imperturbable he takes his time coughs dryly starts perhaps a little haltingly but he comes round with a heavy sweep of his weapon and the thrust is turned it is the english and the irish mind in conflict directness against swiftness stubbornness against subtlety rock against flame i think the speaker enjoys these moments and it is the best tribute to his impartiality that he commands the entire respect of the irishman as of the whole house it is said that when he was offered the speakership he replied the speakership will give me three things i don't need it will give me a peerage which i don't want it will give me a house in town i have that already it will give me a salary of five thousand pounds a year and my income is already sufficient it gave him something else that he did want it gave him the fulfilment of a wholesome ambition it enabled him to put the crown upon a parliamentary record which is i believe without parallel a loather has come from westmoreland to westminster more or less continuously for some six centuries during a century and a half there has been no break in his direct parliamentary ancestry mr loather's great-grandfather sat for half a century his grandfather for half a century his father for a quarter of a century he himself entered the house in eighteen eighty three for rutlandshire after a few years practice at the bar he is a hereditary legislator in the best sense the spirit of parliament is in his blood 
and the honour of parliament is to him something of a personal possession he will abandon none of its ancient forms or etiquette but he tempers them with thoughtful concessions when the poorer members of the house appeal to mr speaker gully to make the wearing of court dress at his functions optional they were met with refusal when they made the same appeal to mr speaker lowther they were met with refusal too but he promptly took the edge off the refusal by inaugurating a series of luncheons where the democratic sans culotte might be free from the tyranny of velvet and gold buttons and silver buckles it was a wise compromise no man in broadcloth and trousers can feel quite happy beside a man who is a sartorial poem it is like pairing a stump speech with a song of herrick mr lowther's success is comforting to the plain man for it is the success of his own russet-coated virtues it is the success of one like himself of a plain man without a touch of genius almost without a touch of brilliancy but with all the qualities of the average man in perfect equilibrium he has culture loves painting almost as much as stalking the deer has since the cambridge days when as mr lothian arcade he used to share the theatrical exploits of lord crew mr alfred littleton and others retained his interest in the drama tells a good story enjoys a good book but he is essentially the ordinary man that is the ordinary man in an extraordinary degree his mind full of daylight the range of his thought limited by the daylight vision his instinct for justice sound his spirit firm and masculine as the strong well-tended hand that he rests upon the arm of the speaker's chair he is not one of those who bring new light into the thought of men or add to the sum of human effort he is the type of the practical man who does his task honestly firmly and good-humouredly that is why taken all in all he is the greatest speaker of our time for the office of speaker does not demand rare qualities it demands common qualities in a rare degree end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty herbert samuel at an eighty club dinner not long ago i was seated beside the chairman who chanced to be mr herbert samuel it was what is known as a house dinner an occasion of more or less informal debate on a given political subject of the moment those who desire to speak are requested to send up their names to the steward who on this occasion was myself as invariably happens at eighty club functions there was an abundance of men ready to talk for political speaking is the raison d'etre of the club the names were put down in order and handed to the chairman he took them and turning to me said you will speak i replied that i had no intention of speaking oh yes said mr samuel you must speak and he inserted my name high up on the list i laughed and took an opportunity of putting my pen through the name he smiled took up his pen and restored it i am serious i said so am i he replied when the list was exhausted as far as my name i said please pass my name without turning he announced me to follow and i obeyed i do not mention this incident in any spirit of retaliation but because it illustrates the character of mr herbert samuel better than anything i can recall he is implacable and masterful a man clothed in a suit of impenetrable mail it is his golden rule to have his own way not for selfish reasons but because it is the right way argument is wasted on him entreaty breaks helplessly at the foot of his frozen purpose he hears your argument with a polite air of having heard all of them from the beginning and found them worthless he listens to your appeals with the chill calm of an iceberg it would be easier i think to extract tears from the cromwell statue than to extract from mr samuel a concession which he did not wish to make if one were asked to find the antithesis of mr balfour in the house of commons one would turn i think to mr samuel with mr balfour all is speculative and formless there is nothing fixed and absolute 
he is stricken with the paralysis of indecision mr samuel on the other hand makes decision a habit of mind i imagine he has a settled conviction about everything under the sun if there is anything about which he has no settled conviction then it is outside the range of his interests and does not exist for him he is one of those men whose minds are always made up you do not see them in the process of being made up it is as though they were made up to start with on the basis of some absolute formula which leaves nothing more to be said everything is chose juge in mr samuel's precise and profusely pigeonholed mind there is no room for hesitation about conclusions because there is no room for doubt about facts there is nothing of the oriental man of mystery about mr samuel but one would have to search long and industriously to discover the reality that dwells behind this perfectly equipped defence most men have their moments of unofficial freedom moments after dinner for example when they throw off the mask and delight to be gloriously indiscreet holmes says that every man has two doors to himself one which he keeps open to the world and another through which only the privileged are permitted to enter or which is opened in moments of deep feeling or generous confidence in the case of mr samuel one feels that the key rusts in the lock of that secret door he has made discretion into a fine art said one of his colleagues to me he is the type of efficiency there is no more industrious man in the ministry none whom you find more completely equipped in knowledge or in clear-cut decisive opinion no matter what subject you raise bearing on his department you find that this undemonstrative wise young man is prepared to crush you with blue books you have never heard of and experiences of places where you have never been when i met him at the sweated industries exhibition the impression left was that of a man who had nothing to learn on the subject he had studied it in the east end he had studied it on the continent years before he could tell you more than you could ever hope to know you felt humbled and cheap in this enormous capacity for mastering the details of a subject this enthusiasm for the letter as it were he is typical of his race the genius of the jew is the genius for taking infinite pains he may lack inspiration but his power of application his mastery of the letter gives him a knowledge that is more potent than inspiration where the book is concerned he is unrivalled he stakes out a claim with calculating confidence and develops it with an unremitting industry and an unimpassioned concentration that assures success he gets up his subject with a thoroughness that the englishman rarely imitates lasker has not the fascination of morphy or even of pillsbury but he is the greatest chess player that ever lived for he knows chess as no man ever knew it before the jew rarely produces great art or great music but he is supreme in his knowledge of these realms it is nearly always a jew who is the expert shakespearean scholar just as it is always a jew who will decide the authenticity of a van eyck or a botticelli when one of the rothschilds advised buxton on his career he warned him against scattering his energies concentration he said is the one road to success in business dispersion the one certainty of failure stick to brewing and you will be the first brewer in london take up banking shipping commerce and your name will soon appear in the gazette it was the jew revealing the secret of the astonishing success of his race mr samuel's faculty for mastering detail was revealed in the children's bill which mr herbert gladstone surrendered entirely to his hands no more humane measure has ever been before parliament and certainly parliament never saw a measure more ably handled both in the house and in committee it was impossible to find a flaw in the workmanship and mr samuel's skill in committee won the rare distinction of a dinner in honour of his success it was the success of one who has in remarkable combination the suivete in modo and the fortite in re he is thrice armed for he adds to knowledge rare astuteness and blameless temper it is impossible to trip him up either in fact or in feeling he has the enormous advantage of always knowing more about his subject than his opponent and that is a great aid to serenity of temper 
there are two ways of governing men said disraeli in one of his novels either you must be superior to them or despise them mr samuel has adopted the better way his philosophy of conduct i take it is similar to that of mr chamberlain it was the practice of mr chamberlain to come into council with everything cut and dried it was his role to put things through he knew that men are always ready to follow any one who will tell them what to do i see how things go in the cabinet said sir henry campbell bannerman on one occasion after he had been called in by lord salisbury to advise in regard to some royal and non-party question lord salisbury explains that nothing can be done and that even if anything could be done it would probably be a miserable failure and then he calls on mr balfour to say a few words and mr balfour's head ascends into the clouds and he invests the subject with a delicate haze after which perhaps the colonial secretary has a suggestion says the premier and mr chamberlain comes forward prompt and practical with his scheme down in black and white and his mind made up and the thing is done as in the cabinet so on committees and councils of all sorts one of the governors of the birmingham university tells that on one occasion mr chamberlain startled the meeting by saying that what the university wanted was a siena tower a siena tower exclaimed his colleagues in alarm what we want is a chair for this and a chair for that and what we want is a siena tower said mr chamberlain icily as though he were speaking through the twittering of sparrows and putting his hand in his pocket to save time i have had some drawings prepared and says the informant we found ourselves outside half an hour later having agreed to the erection of a siena tower which none of us wanted at a cost of fifty thousand pounds which we hadn't got and which we needed for the equipment of the university those who have acted on committees with mr samuel will recognize the likeness he also comes as it were with his design for a siena tower in his pocket he does not say much he is quiet and unobtrusive as the talk wanders on around him then at the perfectly chosen moment he interposes with chill incisiveness and enormous gravity and you feel that an end has come to the vaporings of irresponsible frivolity perhaps you feel that the incisiveness is studied and the gravity a little excessive but that does not diminish the impression a keen blade has been suddenly run through a bag of idle wind he conveys no impression of enthusiasm and is as free from passion as an oyster he will never give his leader or his party a moment's disquiet for he will never depart a hair's breadth from the path of strict correctitude he says exactly the right word in exactly the right accent his work is done without a flaw and if his manner lacks a little the spontaneous warmth that takes men captive it has the unruffled and considered courtesy that sheds a certain grave decorum not to say solemnity over your intercourse manners said emerson were invented to keep fools at a distance and though mr samuel would not put it so crudely as that he probably agrees with the sentiment i have been told by one who was a comrade of his in childhood that his favourite amusement was politics and that when other boys were reading ballantyne he was reading blue books for him indeed one can conceive no youth of rose-light and romance wherein he dreamt of paynim and of paladin no time when he cherished a sentiment or coquetted with an illusion one can imagine him as a boy at university college school planning out his future with the quiet certitude of a mathematical mind engaged on an easy negotiable proposition and having planned it working silently and unceasingly for its accomplishment it is characteristic of his assured restraint that ambitious as he is he has never sought to force the pace of his progress no extravagance of speech or action is ever associated with his carefully considered career he does not thrust himself into the limelight he is content to be forgotten he knows the power of discreet silence as the man of taste knows the value of the blank space on the wall among the potentialities of the liberalism of the future he and mr masterman are among the most considerable 
they represent respectively the science and the sentiment of politics sense and sensibility the one is intellect the other emotion it would be hazardous to cast the horoscope of mr masterman he is the wind that bloweth where it listeth indifferent to theories impatient of slow processes governed only by a compelling passion for humanity the dreamer of dreams and the seer of visions it remains to be seen what effect office will have upon a temperament which seems better fitted to inspire than direct mr samuel's path is as defined and absolute as a geometrical line he is the artificer of politics confident of his aim master of himself and his materials secure in his opinion inflexible in purpose a splendidly efficient instrument but never an inspiration End of chapter 30Chapter 31 of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 The Tsar. I was sitting in my room one day in March last year when Miss Clementina Black and Madame Stepniak called on me with a young man dressed in the garb of a workman. He was very fair, and his light blue eyes had that look of childlike simplicity and frankness that goes straight to the heart. It was a look that seemed to leave nothing to be told. A decent, sober, industrious young artisan, you would have said, and passed on. But he was indeed the most significant figure I have ever met. When I think of Russia, I see it through those mild blue eyes he was a lithuanian workman peter pedrickson his name he had been a member of a political organization and had been arrested with others in the midst of the riga horrors had been flogged and tortured and finally sentenced to be shot he was detained for the night in a village near riga in a wooden shanty for the prisons were so full that accommodation had to be extemporized in the darkness he was taken outside by the jailers to the lavatory the irons were on his leg and the jailers carried rifles escape seemed impossible but to-morrow he was to die when to-morrow means death men do not shrink from the risk of a rifle shot the drowning man snatched at the last straw of life in the lavatory he managed with a stone to loosen the nut of one of the irons then bursting through the door he made one wild rush for liberty the jailers fired but the night was dark and they missed their aim and the time they gave to firing should have been given to pursuit for the forest was close at hand perhaps too they had mercy felt like hubert some touch of pity for those trustful appealing eyes however that may be the youth dragging his irons with him reached the cover of the woods and safety he freed himself from the irons wandered for two days and nights in the forest then hidden in a hay-cart by a friendly driver reached the home of a friend where he remained in hiding for three weeks before escaping across the frontier and here he was in bouvery street telling his thrilling story quietly and simply through the mouth of madame stepniak his back still bore the cruel marks of the lash and he unlaced his boots and showed me his toe-nails broken in the torture what was he going to do he was going to switzerland to join other refugees for a short time and then then i am going back back but you are sentenced to death i must take my chance he spoke with the calmness of that fatalism that is so deeply rooted in the russian character i have never seen him since but three months ago i received a letter from madame stepniak you remember she said the young lithuanian i brought to see you some time ago i have just heard of his death he returned to russia was recaptured and shot multiply that pathetic figure by thousands and tens of thousands see in it the symbol of a system controlling a hundred and twenty million lives and you have the russia of the czar what of the czar mr heath the english tutor of the czar relates that one day he and his pupil were reading together the lady of the lake 
they came to that spirited description of the scene in stirling when the castle gates were flung wide open and king james rode out amid the shouts of the populace long live the commons king king james the commons king exclaimed the boy with sparkling eyes that is what i should like to be the emotion was sincere for nicholas the second is one of those unhappy figures in whom emotion is divorced from conduct an idealist faithless to his ideals a visionary doomed to violate his visions he has a feminine shrinking from war and plunges his country into the bloodiest war in history he looks towards england and yearns for its free air and its free institutions its commons king and its happy people and every day throughout his wide realm the hangman's noose is round the politician's neck and the jailer's key is turned upon the cry of liberty what is the mystery behind this perplexing personality that seems at once so humane and so merciless that expresses itself now in a peace rescript now in approval of the infamous doings of the black hundreds that is compact of the shyness of a girl and the intense fanatical spirit of philip the second that would be a commons king and yet a despot there is no need to question the sincerity of his moods on the ground that they are mutually destructive even the best of men are conscious of that duality which leighton referred to in one of his letters to his sister in which he said for together with and as it were behind so much pleasurable emotion there is always that other strange second man in me calm observant critical unmoved blase odious there is that other self too in the czar fanatical terrible and alas triumphant perhaps the wonder is that with such an ancestry and such a tutelage there should be any generous human emotion at all for the history of his house is like a nightmare of blood his father was as superstitious as a medieval warrior he would cross himself and even fall on his knees in prayer if a cloud obscured the sun while he was looking through the window and he died in the arms of the miracle-monger father john of kronstadt his grandfather was assassinated in the public street his great-grandfather is supposed to have committed suicide under the pressure of the disasters in the crimea the emperor paul was murdered in eighteen o one and the vices of paul's mother catherine the second place her among the greatest criminals in royal history her husband was uh, removed ivan the sixth was buried in a dungeon for twenty-four years and then murdered but why pursue the story it is stained with blood right back to that pagan author of the romanovs the chieftain kobila who was driven from lithuania into russia in the fourteenth century for refusing to adopt christianity the contemplation of such a family history would shadow any life it ought also to have taught the lesson of the futility of despotism it did in fact teach it as we see in that emotion of the boy stirred by the cry of the commons king but it was the emotion of a mind ungoverned by character and subject to fanatical obsession had his impressionable temperament been moulded by generous influences the course of russian history would have been happier but he fell at the beginning under the medieval spirit of pobiadonistef the procurator of the holy synod the torquemada of modern times who instilled into him his doctrines of oriental despotism chilled by the frost of his bloodless philosophy under the baleful guidance of pobiadonistef and prince meshivsky he became imbued as the writer of an article in the quarterly review pointed out long before his character was realized with the conviction that he was god's lieutenant the earthly counterpart of his divine master that obsession working on a mind naturally occult and timorous has driven as it were the disease of despotism inward withering the feeble intimations of a more humane emotion isolating him from his people and converting every expression of popular thought into revolt against the divine will embodied in his own person this perverted intensity is the natural product of a superstitious mind in a febrile body 
for he has none of the animalism and physical ebullience of his race his tastes are domestic and simple he is devoted to his wife and his children the last refuge of his solitary life and he loves to sit and read to the empress from the english authors while she is engaged in her embroidery in the evening he has a passion for cycling but for sport he has neither the taste nor the nerve in the language of the old keeper who was in attendance on him when he was the guest of lord lonsdale in westmoreland the czar did not know enough to hold a gun straight nor to hit a bird his lack of physical daring was exhibited in the attack made on him by an assassin when as the czarevich he was touring in japan with the crown prince of greece the latter wrote to his father a letter describing the incident and in it used the phrase then nicky ran by some indiscretion that phrase leaked out and all russian society went about shrugging its shoulders and murmuring then nicky ran perhaps it was this timidity that was the cause of the most fatal act in his career no monarch in history was ever faced with a more splendid occasion than that which offered itself to nicholas on the twenty second of january nineteen o five the war was ending in disaster the country was in revolt against its own misery and wrong and against the corruption and incompetence of the bureaucracy but it still had a remnant of faith in the little father it would go to him at his palace with a petition to him to make its cause his own against the tyranny that oppressed it the people gathered in tens of thousands before the palace it was a moment for a hero it was the moment to win the love of a people or to lose it forever and nicholas was not there he had fled overnight to jarko selo and left the duke vladimir with his cossacks to greet his subjects with sword and musket the streets ran with blood more people fell that day than in any battle of the boer war and nicholas fell for ever with them the lack of physical courage is companioned by the infirmity of will illustrated by the story of a conversation between the czar and the empress which delighted russia last year and which ran as follows the empress my dear nicholas you must not always agree with everybody now this morning monsieur stolpin made a report and after he had finished you said monsieur stolpin you are quite right i quite agree with you five minutes later durnovo came what he told you was absolutely opposed to what stolypin had said but again you remarked my dear de novo you are quite right i quite agree with you finally monsieur swanenbach came and told you something different from what the other two gentlemen had said and again you replied monsieur swanenbach you are quite right i quite agree with you the czar after a moment's reflection my dear alexandra you are quite right i quite agree with you this infirmity of purpose gives that sense of confusion that pervades all his actions he yields and withdraws creates a constitution and destroys it sets up a duma and throws it down yearns for universal peace and blunders into war he is always under hypnotic suggestion now faltering between the rival feminine influences of his court now subject to the cold inhuman philosophy of a meshkurtiski now dominated by the mystical charlatanry of m philippe with his miracles and spirit messages for superstition is the essential atmosphere of his mind and he dwells in the realm of wonder-working relics one of the saints seraphim of sarov he ordered to be canonized in spite of the disconcerting fact that though he had been buried only seventy years the saint's body was decomposed the orthodox bishop dmitri of tambov protested on this ground against the beatification as contrary to church traditions but he was deprived of his see and sent to vyatka for venturing to disagree with the czar for his majesty holds that the preservation of the bones the hair and the teeth is a sufficient qualification for saintship with these views it follows that his devotion to the orthodox faith is as intense as it is narrow 
it has resulted not only in the merciless suppression of the armenian church and of the dissenters but even in the harrying of the old believers who are an important branch of the state church and the bodies of whose saints have been disinterred and burned the cruelest episode of the persecution of the old believers was that of bishop methodius who administered the sacraments to a man who born in the state church had joined the old believers methodius a man of seventy-eight was arrested for his uh, crime and condemned to banishment to siberia whither with irons on his feet and penned up with criminals he was dispatched at yakutsk he remained some time but a dignitary of the state church intervened and he was ordered to be sent on to vilius in northeastern siberia a place inhabited by savages the aged bishop was set astride a horse to which he was tied and told that he must ride thus to his new place of exile about seven hundred miles distant this sentence is death by torture said methodius flock they were not mistaken the old man gave up the ghost on the road eighteen ninety eight but when where and how he was buried has never been made known this and other persecutions says the writer of the quarterly review article to which i have referred were brought to the notice of his majesty without eliciting even an expression of regret it is the tragedy of the infirm will always to become the prey of the most virile influences it treads the path of least resistance and in turn the fanatical obsession inculcated by those influences sanctifies every action with a divine imprimatur from this vicious sequence we have the phenomenon of merciless oppression emerging from a personally shy and timid source in the field of such a mind the victory is always to the most intense and ruthless and subtle weakness takes refuge in strength and timidity in terrorism the boyish emotion that cried out a commons king that is what i should like to be ends in a political gospel founded on the maxim of de pleve severity served up cold is the only way with empire wreckers everywhere the autocracy takes on the aspect of vengeance and repression the massacre of jews the banishment of Finns, the spoliation of armenians the persecution of poles the exile of russian nobles the flogging of peasants the imprisonment and butchery of russian workingmen the establishment of a widespread system of espionage and the abolition of law are all measures which the minister suggests and the czar heartily sanctions that was written before the mockery of a constitution was granted but the spirit of the government is the same to-day the deplevs and the bobrikovs have gone to their doom but their successors are like unto them the hand that conferred a star upon prince obolensky for his energy in flogging the peasants of the government of kharkov until many of them died is the same hand that decorates the tsarevich with the badge of the black hundreds that terrible instrument of vengeance formed almost at the moment that the constitution was granted and already drenched in a sea of innocent blood nor is it only the fierce barbaric spirits to which he is subject he has the credulity that makes him the easy instrument of the impostor and the visionary whether of the spiritualistic type of philippe or of the type of the eccentric adventurer bezobrazov whose vast speculative scheme for developing the yalu forest fascinated first the grand dukes eager for plunder and then the czar who became an investor gave him plenipotentiary powers subordinated kuropatkin and lambsdorff to him allowed him to make the incompetent alexia viceroy of manchuria and so drifted into the catastrophe of the war he will live as the man who made the great refusal of history he might have been the founder of a new and happier russia the commons king of his youthful vision he has chosen to be an autocrat and a prisoner in his forty palaces in ten years his rule has exiled seventy-eight thousand of his subjects and driven all the best of the nation's sons that have escaped siberia to take refuge in other lands but he himself is the saddest exile of all 
for he is exiled from the domain of our common humanity a prisoner in body and in spirit hedged round by his guards suspecting the cup that he drinks forbidden to dine anywhere save in his own palace receiving his guests at sea for he dare not receive them ashore a hapless pitiful figure that sits perked up on a glistering grief and wears a golden sorrow what would one rather be the prisoner of the palace or that young lithuanian carpenter with the blue appealing eyes and the toenails broken in the torture who gave his blood in the sacred cause of human liberty end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two dr horton when you enter the church at lyndhurst road you are conscious if you happen to be sensitive to atmosphere of a certain subdued note of expectancy the impression grows as the service advances there is a breath on the face of the waters the subtle breath of personality perhaps the key is minor appealing poignant the preacher is in the grip of some strong emotion which colors him and prayer and lesson peeps out from the little fable he addresses to the children and is fully revealed in the sermon it is as though he has come from some sudden vision of the world's wickedness and the world's wrong it is visible and audible he hears the world thundering by to destruction in a frenzy of luxury and pleasure and heedless riot the rush of motor-cars and the clatter of wheels on haverstock hill break in on the tense strain they are like the voice of the doomed world drowning the cry of the prophet he leans forward with outstretched hands pleading pleading he is torn with bitter agony his voice is shaken by the tumult of his feelings a moment more and the tense bow must break but he draws himself up closes the bible and the troubled sea sinks down in the calm of a hymn and the peace of the benediction outside someone touches you on the shoulder with a light greeting it is like the breaking of a spell or perhaps it is a bright morning in spring the song of birds is heard on the heath and out in golders hill he has seen the snowdrops bursting from their winter prison the first syllables in the poetry of the year the heralds of the pageant of the earth and his heart sings with the glad tidings of the new birth he has seen the finger of god in the woodlands he has heard the voice of the eternal by the seashore he has picked up a shell and found in it thoughts that do lie too deep for tears for the earth is filled with the whispers of the most high i find letters from god dropped in the street and each one is signed by god's name and i leave them where they are for i know that wheresoever i go others will punctually follow for ever and ever and full of this gracious assurance the service flows on golden wings to a golden close the rush of motor-cars and the clatter of wheels break in on the melody but not harshly nor discordantly almost they seem like a part of the universal song of the reawakened earth but a day comes of bitter self-abasement he is bowed down with the sense of failure due you will discover to some quite small and isolated incident he is stricken with remorse with the passion of weakness and futility a word a breath has set all the chords vibrating to the miserere the sorrow of the world is his and the sin of the world too for what has he done to alleviate the one and wash out the other he is the unfaithful servant he is the bringer of a message which he has failed to deliver the world is deaf because he has not unstopped its ears the world is blind because he has not unsealed its eyes he stands like whittier in the presence of his soul and arraigns it like a felon dr horton is the type of the poet prophet in the pulpit he has the poet's intensity of vision the poet's quick emotional response the poet's imaginative fervor tennyson said of swinburne that he is a tube through which all things blow into music it is the music of the senses poured from old triton's wreathed horn 
dr horton is a voice through which the emotions of the soul issue in impromptu passion now breathless with adoration now flaming with wrath he draws from a direct well of inspiration he comes as it were from some journey of the soul filled with a message which is not his own a message urgent tyrannical he has seen a vision and hurries from the road to damascus to proclaim the thrilling tidings he is consumed with the agitation of the spirit and cannot rest till the vision is revealed it is this emotion that makes his appeal so poignant so disquieting in its intensity so healing in its more placid moods you cannot be indifferent under him he touches you to the quick to a responsive passion of revolt or acceptance his whole message is a challenge to you you personally you alone it is you to whom the moment has come to decide between the bloom and blight you for whom the choice goes by forever twixt that darkness and that light you shall make the choice here and now you shall not escape he will not let you go until you have chosen either for the goats upon the left hand or the sheep upon the right there is in this overmastering urgency and this swift changefulness of mood a certain loss of sustained power he does not see life steadily or whole and lacks the fundamental quietude of spirit that would give harmony to the varying moods and this subjection to the emotion reacts upon his thought which is sometimes singularly narrow and at others as broad as the heavens he is in a word not so much a thinker as a spiritual impressionist he sees truth as it were by flashes of lightning where others arrive at it by the slow operation of intellect and if the truth he sees is sometimes a little out of drawing that is usually the case with impressionism a sermon by dr hunter delights you by its mental power it is the appeal of the mind to the mind dr horton's is the appeal of the heart to the heart he has a feminine fervor and impatience of fetters he surrenders himself to his emotion and soars with wings he does not argue he proclaims an incident a phrase a thought has opened a sudden window into the spiritual world and he is unconscious of all save the vision this sensitiveness to impression the faculty of seeing the infinite in the infinitesimal has always characterized him as a little boy at a dame school he heard a lad of hard bad face and blasphemous tongue answering the question who gave you that name with the words of the catechism my baptism wherein i was made a child of god and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven and the shock of that unconscious satire sealed the impressionable child for nonconformity and later at shrewsbury he arrived by the same sensitive response at another far-reaching conclusion he and two others a ritualistic churchman and an evangelical churchman anticipating the union of the churches established a prayer meeting in the study just before evening call over a flame of enthusiasm passed through the school and the study became crowded but persecution came the world symbolized by the rest of the school blocked the passage crowded the exit cuffed kicked and cursed those daring innovators the uproar reached the ears of the headmaster who threw his cold protection over these young dissenters some of us he said may think that the prayers in chapel and in top schools are sufficient but if there are boys that desire more and wish to pray together in their study they shall not be interrupted the invasion of authority in the sphere of religion was fatal the persecution ceased but so also did the prayer meetings and young horton's mind leapt to another truth that christianity does not require the countenance or the support of the state and is only vital when it can defy persecution and is independent of the powers of the world he has the defects of the impressionist when he comes down into the world of affairs he is perplexed by its ingenuities and cunning impatient of its restraints entirely unsophisticated and without any of the worldly but necessary qualities of suspicion or distrust it is surprising to learn that when at oxford the invitation came to him to take charge of a new church at hampstead he was contemplating a career at the bar 
his mind would have fretted itself to death in the chill prison of legal forms and amid the dry detail of precedent for of all the theatres of the world's conflict there is none so passionless and calculating as the law and dr horton is all passion and no calculation impulse governs him and governs him aright but in affairs he is at sea and his impulse is checked and chilled by the calculations of others thus as president of the free church council he wrote in the midst of the education controversy a powerful appeal for the secular solution it was a critical moment with courage he would have carried the day and that truth which came to him at shrewsbury would have won an enduring triumph but he was overborne by the counsels of worldly caution and recanted like all prophets he is an indifferent politician the defect of men like horton and meyer said a friend of both himself the son of a great churchman of other days is the excess of their high qualities they live in an atmosphere of unceasing spiritual exaltation the strain is never relaxed they would be more powerful if they were more earthly there is some truth in the criticism the soul needs its fallow seasons like the body if it never descends from sinai to the common ways of men it sacrifices some of its fellowship with life it may even lead men astray on great human issues as it led dr horton astray in regard to the true inwardness of the boer war and yet without that aloofness the peculiar value of dr horton would be lacking he is a voice crying in the wilderness of the world around him he hears the sound of the tumult of life whirling in giddy mazes of pleasure about the gods of the market-place shot through with cries of pain watered with hopeless tears and ringing with idle laughter it is a world that has broken from the ancient anchorage he sees it drifting over uncharted seas beneath a starless sky we are like corpses in a charnel fear and grief convulse us and consume us day by day and cold hopes swarm within the living clay and filled with the sense of a sick world he comes with the passionate reassertion of the faith as the only cure of its ills reform society by all means he says to the socialists but the most perfect organization will never make the world whole for the kingdom of god is within you and outside that kingdom there is no peace he is a puritan engrafted with oxford culture a puritan with the atmosphere of a liberal scholarship and the graces of taste and sensitive feeling oxford has no more devoted son and no better justification for opening her doors to dissenters in those days he says it was good to be a nonconformist at oxford for every one was bent on showing that the position involved no disqualifications oxford gave him a fellowship and almost claimed him for her own and out of that tender memory of his oxford days springs the affection he always shows towards the church whose system nevertheless seems to him so far removed from the essential principles of christianity but the cool seclusion of oxford any more than the dry atmosphere of the law could not have satisfied that urgent temperament he was born to preach one of his earliest memories is that of standing on a dining-room chair in his grandfather's house near covent garden market with his grandparents and certain guests and domestics for audience and preaching armed with a ball to hurl at any who should laugh it was his grandmother who laughed first and loudest and at whom more in sorrow than in anger he hurled his missile the dream of the child was the true foreshadowing of the man his vocation the fulfilment of his mother's hope it shapes itself to me he has said as the thought and the wish of my mother wrought out silently in her heart and carried just as i was leaving school for the university over into the land beyond death and there working ceaselessly and effectually so that it would not surprise me if at any time my eyes were opened and i found that she an invisible spirit had remained by my side all the way to complete the purpose with which she started me on the journey end of chapter thirty two
Chapter thirty three of Prophets, Priests, and Kings by Alfred George Gardiner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three Philip Snowden. It was the eve of the general election of nineteen hundred. The khaki fever was at its height and liberalism at the lowest ebb of its fortunes. Nowhere was it lower than at Blackburn. For twenty years the capital of the weaving trade had been a stronghold of conservatism, and now there was no liberal with sufficient courage even to challenge it. Suddenly there appeared on the scene a stranger out of the West Riding. So feeble he seemed that he moved the foe to pity more than anger. He came limping into the lists on foot, a pallid, hatchet-faced young man, small of stature, and leaning heavily on a stick, one foot dragging helplessly along the ground. His face was scored with the brand of suffering and bitter thought. He had, as the result of a bicycle accident, lain twelve months motionless upon his bed, and had stolen back to the ways of men a maimed and stricken figure. He came unattended. There was no one to receive him save a few eager working men who had been preaching socialism to deaf ears in the marketplace. There was no organization to work for him. There was no money at his command. He seemed like David going out with his pebble and his sling against the hosts of the Philistines. It was the battle of the one and the fifty-three. Thousands of their soldiers leaned from their decks and laughed, thousands of their seamen made mock of the mad little craft running on and on but that was at the beginning later on as in the fight at flores soldiers and seamen had other work to do by the end of the battle they were fighting for dear life for philip snowden wrought a miracle that election will never be forgotten by those who witnessed it it was like a sudden wind stirring the leaves of the forest it was a revival movement gathering momentum with each hour. Philip Snowden's name was on every lip. His sayings ran like rumor through the weaving sheds and the street. Men in their greasy caps and carrying their kits hurried from the mills to his meetings and sat as if hypnotized under the spell of revelation. He fought the battle absolutely single-handed, and he fought it with a dignity of spirit rare in politics snowden is an atheist was chalked on a hundred walls he ignored the slander snowden was dismissed from the excise passed from lip to lip again he was silent he was urged to tell the real facts which were entirely honourable to him no he said i have resolved to fight this battle on politics and not on personalities and from that i will not move in a fortnight in spite of the crushing odds against him in spite of the war fever in spite of the church and the brewers wealth influence and the popularity of the two tory candidates he had shaken the gibraltar of toryism to its foundations to-day he sits for blackburn the first member other than a conservative who has represented the constituency for a quarter of a century i take philip snowden to be the typical socialist in parliament he is the man of the idee fixe. You see it in the drawn face, the clenched mouth, the cold, uncompromising gray eyes. Other men of his party will yield a little to gain much. He yields nothing. He is the steady, relentless foe of society as it is constituted. He will have no half-measures, no coquettings with the enemy. His theory or nothing." He owes his seat largely to liberal votes, but he makes no sign of recognition or thanks. Liberalism is to him as Toryism. Nay, it is more detestable than Toryism, because it is more dangerous to his aims. He stands for revolution, a bloodless revolution, but still a revolution. Toryism, with its reactionary impulses, paves the way to revolution liberalism with its moderate reforms defeats revolution hence toryism is in some sense a friend while liberalism blunting the edge of popular demand is the real enemy and so when mr snowden goes about the country it is liberalism which is the target of his bitterest attacks he will acknowledge no good thing in it 
he will take nothing from it with thanks for its best gifts are only intended to make existing society tolerable and he wants it to be intolerable one evening i was talking after dinner with a group of liberal politicians and the conversation turned to the strength of absolute uncompromising socialism in parliament here hardy said one calculates that there are ten socialists in the house we set ourselves to find them ramsay macdonald not a socialist first but a politician said one not a socialist but an opportunist said another peach curran not a socialist first but an irishman said a third let john redmond say home rule to-day and the social revolution to-morrow and curran will follow the banner of ireland victor grayson the wine is too new in the bottle give him time and so the weeding out went on at each name some qualifying circumstance of sympathy or outlook was recalled only at two names was there no pause the names of keir hardy and philip snowden they are socialists sans phrase others subscribe to the economic theories of socialism they alone live for them and for nothing else others join in the political fray they stand aloof from what they regard as idle trifling their eyes fixed on the ultimate goal to them the house of commons is not a place for petty skirmishes and paltry triumphs it is a platform from whence to preach the social revolution they will not prune the tree they will uproot it most men who go to the house of commons no matter what their views or their social rank soon fall in with the spirit of the place they share its common life and enjoy its social comradeship many of them indeed find the spirit of the place a solvent of principle they find the virgin enthusiasm they brought with them from the country languishes in this atmosphere of geniality and compromise the principle that was so clear on the platform where you had it all to yourself is not so unchallengeable here the tory with whom you have smoked a pipe down below is quite a pleasant fellow and in his way just and the liberal or labor man with whom you had a chat on the terrace seems really an honest man misguided of course but still with a good deal of reason in him the sharp lines get blurred and black and white tend to shade away into varying tones of gray philip snowden stands aloof from all this tendency lonely unyielding consumed with one passionate purpose this house of commons through which he moves with painful steps what is it but the mirror of the social system that he hopes to see shattered property 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 that's what he hears it say he is in it but not of it he looks out on it with cold bitter scrutiny a faint wistful smile flits across his pale face as he talks to you but it is the smile of polite formality it has no relation to the fierce fire that burns within steadily unchangeably a fire that would consume you with the rest of the regime of wrong he is the stuff of which revolutions are made i have not been in the house when he has spoken but i am told that he has not been a parliamentary success it would be strange if he were the house loves the atmosphere of sympathy here is no sympathy but bitter challenge it loves light and color and easy raillery playing upon the surface of its purposes here is nothing but fierce intensity ruthless and implacable but i doubt whether there is any man living to-day with an equal power of moving great bodies of men to a certain exaltation of spirit of communicating his own passion to others of giving to politics something of the fervor of religious emotion he is doctrinaire and academic in the extreme but he fuses his theories with an enthusiasm that burns at white heat if ever there were a revolution in this country i do not know who would be its danton but i should have no doubt as to who would be its robespierre not the robespierre of the september massacres but the robespierre of the concentrated and remorseless purpose constancy is a rare virtue in politics 
there are few men of whom it would be safe to forecast their intellectual and political point of view ten years hence but whatever happens philip snowden will be where he stands to-day he will neither ask quarter nor yield it he will fight his battle out on these lines though it takes all his life and he has nothing to record but defeat i am told that he will lose blackburn in the next election because of his bitter attitude toward liberalism one thing is certain he will do nothing to conciliate the liberals he must be taken on his terms if taken at all compromise is not in him he is one of those rare men who live for an idea and who have neither aim nor ambition outside it he would wade through slaughter to achieve it he would go to the stake rather than surrender the least fragment of it if you want to realize the purpose and the passion of socialism he is the man to watch he is worth watching as a study of intensity and idealism he is still more worth watching as one of the potentialities of our national life for if socialism ever came to power and that depends largely on whether liberalism is a sufficiently effective instrument of reform to keep it at bay it will be philip snowden who will be largely the architect of the new social structure end of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four robert burden haldane life it has been said is a comedy to him who thinks and a tragedy to him who feels judged by this axiom mr haldane is the man who thinks he bathes the world in wreathed smiles and floods it with infectious good humour he seems to go through life humming softly to himself toujours bien jamais mieux is his motto what a delightful world it is he seems to say and what a capital fellow you are and what capital fellows we all are it is like the comfortable purring of a cat on the hearthrug it fills you with the ecstasy of a quiet content everything is snug and warm the kettle is singing on the hob the fire burns brightly in the grate and though the wind howls and moans outside it serves only as a foil to the comfort within it is the best of all possible worlds he has always been so his mother with whom he lives will tell you he is always cheerful never worries and works incessantly this unconquerable good humour is perhaps less the result of philosophy than of a good digestion he comes of a hardy strain the haldanes were fighters in the brave days of old one fell at flodden and others also found immortality on the battlefield for generations they have been remarkable for their pedestrian powers mr haldane's grandfather thought little of an eight-mile walk even in his eighty-third year and there is a story that his granduncle having been prayed for by one of his clerical friends as thine aged and infirm servant suggested a little stroll from which the clerical friend returned in such a state of exhaustion that he fell into a deep slumber from which he could hardly be aroused in time for the service he was to perform mr haldane himself is credited with having frequently walked sixty or seventy miles in a day while his brothers are said to have established a record of a hundred and three and one half miles under thirty-one hours his big alert frame and his massive neck suggest those physical resources which have made his powers of work and endurance possible nothing in the way of work can be done without a big boiler and a bull neck said a sea captain to me long ago mr haldane has both and his capacity for work has always been remarkable this physical energy is matched by a similar mental energy he has lived four careers philosopher lawyer politician and man of the world and has spared himself in none of them he is an intellectual steam engine when once he has started talking there seems to be no reason why he should ever leave off there is no end to him his oratory is like an interminable round of beef you may cut and come again 
one feels that the river of his rhetoric will flow on forever fed by a thousand inexhaustible rills the smooth wooing voice inundates the house with a flood of words the enemy attempts to dam the torrent in vain in vain does mr arnold forster raise his head above the flood and utter an angry interjection he is engulfed by a wave from the rhetorical ocean and the waters flow on in copious unconcern he has been known at the end of the second hour of a speech to start afresh with a pleasant remark on these preliminary observations on one occasion he went to a volunteer dinner and came away telling his friends that every one had approved his scheme he did not know that the company had come together seething with objections and had been literally talked into silence and surrender it was said of gladstone that when it suited his purpose no one could wander more widely from his subject it may be said of mr haldane that no one can invest a subject in a more lucid fog a lucid fog i know seems like a contradiction in terms but no one who has heard mr haldane speak for say three hours will deny that there is such a thing the lucidity of his mind is as conclusive as the fog in yours the clearer he becomes to himself the more hopeless is your bewilderment if only one could feel that he himself was getting a little lost in this amazing labyrinth of locution one could feel less humiliated but it is obvious that the less you understand him the more he understands himself he smiles urbanely upon you and points the fat didactic finger at you with pleasant intimacy he does you the honour of pretending that you follow him and self-respect compels you to accept the delicate tribute to your penetration it is a comedy which saves him a lot of trouble there are some men who seem never to have known a joy in life and there are few who do not have their variations of temperature and their moments of depression mr haldane gives the impression that he has never known a sorrow that there was never a moment in which he was not walking on air in sheer exaltation of mind and body the atmosphere of flagrant enjoyment that he exudes must be an offence to the man of a melancholy habit of mind he cannot help distrusting such an apparently inexhaustible reservoir of cheerfulness no man he feels can be really so happy as mr haldane seems and since that is so it is clear that he is playing a part as for professional optimists said a distinguished philosopher of the opposite school to me one is always sceptical about them they wear too much the strained look of the smile on a skull nothing could be less true of the optimism of mr haldane it is simply a huge capacity for enjoyment fundamentally physical and having no relation to his conclusions about the universe it is customary to poke fun at his hegelianism and to treat his philosophic interests as a disqualification for politics if being and non-being are identical so runs the quip it obviously does not matter whether we have an army in being or an army in non-being but to mr haldane philosophy is only an intellectual exercise as chemistry was to the late lord salisbury or as theology and homer were to gladstone it springs from his sympathy with the german genius for mr haldane is teutonic in his love of abstract thinking and in his enthusiasm for thoroughness and exactness he turns always to germany for inspiration he went thither after graduating at edinburgh and his first literary enterprise was his translation of schopenhauer his dinner table talk is full of german reminiscences and he never misses an opportunity of addressing german visitors on the terrace in their own tongue he is as great a favourite with the king as lord cross used to be with victoria but that fact does not exclude the kaiser from his opulent affections and the kaiser returns the feeling always receives him with enthusiasm and loves to show him his army and it is to the german army that he goes for ideas on one of his visits to berlin he said 
germany as all the world knows has much to teach military students and i am here simply to avail myself of the opportunity of studying her institutions before engaging in any tinkering of our own it is from germany that he brought the idea of a general staff with which he began his reform of the british army it must be admitted too that the type of his liberalism is german it is vague and indeterminate it breathes expediency rather than the compulsion of principle it approaches politics purely as a business proposition and seeks to establish national greatness on scientific and material rather than moral foundations it follows naturally that he was the standard-bearer of lord rosebery through the years of disunion and that during the war he was the chief author and inspirer of the liberal imperial schism his strategy was opposed to the strategy of mr harcourt and the pair were not unequally matched though in one memorable struggle for the soul of the eighty club i think mr harcourt showed the more masterly tactics that he is not lord chancellor is due less to himself than to the perversity and indecision of his leader lord rosebery played a part similar to that which eachin played in the great fight on the north inch described in the fair maid of perth the stalwarts of the clan kale surrounded him with loyal devotion death for hector barer son ahen was the cry as they went into combat but at the crisis of the fight after prodigies of heroism had been performed by others hector turned plunged into the tay and fled from the battle and hal o the wind in the person of stout c b was left master of the field his first act was to appoint sir robert reed to the woolsack he did not love the clan cohil it was a bitter disappointment but mr haldane bore it with his imperturbable air of enjoyment and took up his task at the war office with a passion of zeal that suggested that this was the ambition of his life there had been many new brooms at the war office but never such a new broom as this he swept as it were incessantly and as he swept he talked now to the public now to the army now to parliament his breezy confidence won confidence the world always believes in a man who believes in himself it is the first condition of success and mr haldane's faith in himself amounts to inspiration the world also loves a man who pays it the compliment of taking it into his confidence that is largely the secret of mr haldane's popularity he is always taking you into his confidence queen victoria's objection to gladstone was that he talked to her as if he were addressing a public meeting mr haldane talks to you as if you were the british empire and must be placated at all costs you may doubt his scheme but you cannot doubt his enthusiasm you may dislike his politics but you cannot help being moved by the deference he pays to your judgment it is by these methods that he has conquered the army you cannot resist a man who bursts with such enjoyment into the mess smokes bigger and stronger cigars than any one else and obviously enjoys them more knows as much about explosives as he does about the westminster confession and with all these accomplishments does you the delicate honour of discussing his scheme with you as if your approval were the one thing in the world necessary to his complete happiness one of his predecessors at the war office speaking to me on one occasion about the difficulties of his task said what can you do with these infernal colonels who know less about war than they know about virtue mr haldane knows very well what to do with them he does not lecture them or hector them he talks to them as if he were consulting them and they surrender to his blandishments he yields on small things with such bonhomie that out of sheer chivalry they can't help yielding to him on big ones said one who works with him to me moreover they have had such an experience of war secretaries in the past that by comparison haldane is a jewel and they think that any change would probably be for the worse there is the reason why mr haldane has got his schemes through with such success he greases the wheels well 
these schemes may be good or bad time alone will prove them but to have got them through with so little resistance and to remain relatively popular with the colonels is an achievement in the art of managing men even when he disbanded the third battalion of the scots guards there were tears but few reproaches it was a courageous act for it brought him into conflict with the king and with his old leader the king pronounced a funeral oration on the guards and said he hoped to see them revived while lord rosebery forgetful of all the loyal service of his old lieutenant and remembering only that he dared to be happy without him tore a passion of indignation to tatters and then fell into dramatic silence to awaken later on in a passion about something else i am not sure whether mr haldane invented the word efficiency which has become the hardest worked vocable in politics when humpty dumpty explained how much he meant by impenetrability he added when i make a word do a lot of work like that i always pay it extra on that just principle efficiency ought to-day to be the most prosperous word in the language it represents the political gospel opposed to the fine old english doctrine of muddling through the phrase in which lord rosebery summed up the boer war but whether he invented it or not mr haldane is its recognized exponent efficiency and again efficiency and always efficiency it is the german spirit that he opposes to the french spirit of danton's axiom efficiency and ideas we have won a magnificent victory he said after the general election of nineteen o six what is it that we need what is it that has been wanting in the past i answer in a word ideas we have got the majority have we got the ideas one sees him pausing for the obvious reply not numbers but efficiency is his maxim in the making of an army and he pays himself a modest compliment when he adds i have never had a more congenial occupation than this attempt at reorganization and the introduction of science into the business it remains to be seen whether the german doctrine of thorough can be engrafted on the english stem of hand-to-mouth practicality and whether english liberalism could survive the infusion of bureaucracy which is the basis of mr haldane's clear thinking but whatever the fate of mr haldane and his army reforms may be we may be sure that nothing will ever destroy his indestructible complacency ministries may rise and fall army schemes come and go but his exuberance will remain toujours bien jamais mieux will be his motto and through all the cataclysms of politics he will still go his way humming softly to himself in sheer spiritual revelry end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of prophets priests and kings by alfred george gardiner this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five john burns i was walking one evening along the embankment when i overtook john burns the night was cold but he wore neither overcoat nor gloves for he scorns both as the trappings of effeminate luxury he carried under his arm a huge bound volume of the phalanx a labor journal of long ago which he had just picked up at a bookstall he plunged at once into a stream of that buoyant confident talk which is so characteristic of the man here he says and his hand seizes me like a vice bringing me up short before a tablet of the late queen led into the fence before the temple look at it been up five years not a scratch on it i tell you there's not a country in europe where there is a higher standard of public conduct than here a young couple of the working class pass us arm in arm his iron grasp is once more on me and i am swung round to take note of them that's not the sort of couple the people who vilify the working classes picture believe me sir the courting of the working classes is as pure and chivalrous as anything i know you take it from me the working classes are morally as sound as a bell a flower-girl stops us and with whispering humbleness proffers chrysanthemums 
well my lass it's a cold night for your job he puts money in her hand but waves aside the blooms no no my girl keep them do i look like a man who wants flowers sir he says in reply to some remark i go my own way i trust to my own eyes and ears when ibsen said the strongest man is he who stands alone he had j b in his eye and he watches my merriment with quizzical good humour at waterloo bridge that terrible hand grips me again he opens a door in the hoarding commandeers a foreman and crashes his way over masses of masonry and debris through the tramway tunnel which is being driven under the strand to kingsway his big voice booming out questions and comments all the time out on the embankment again he pulls up before a man whether workman or loafer it is difficult to say well higgins what are you up to now and as higgins proceeds with his apologia i escape there is the man boisterous confident gaily aggressive honest as the day full of the egotism of the child with the child's delighted interest in the passing show of things cabinet minister and working man proud of his present proud of his past most proud of all that he has done time in one of his majesty's prisons he stands four square to all the winds that blow solid as a pedestal of granite short and mighty of limb like hall o the wind his great eyes flashing scorn and challenge from under the terrific eyebrows his nostrils swelling with defiance his voice bursting in upon the tranquillities like a foghorn thick and hoarse from thundering in the open air his gray hair and beard belying the enormous vitality of mind and muscle a man indeed virile and vehement dogmatic as a timetable with an argument as heavy as his fist the powerful natural man of whitman's ideal plain living and high thinking his maxim no alcohol no tobacco no rugs and mufflers no weak concessions to the flesh but cold water and plenty of it within and without early rising and hard walking a game of cricket a swim in the bath and then out sword and have at you a glorious swashbuckler of romance his life an ebullient joy there is not a page in it that he slurs over there is not an hour when he has not found it good to be alive his boundless exuberance fills you like a gale at sea his optimism seems to fill the whole world with the singing of birds and the laughter of children there never was such a world there never was such a country as this england of ours there never was such a city as this glorious london do you doubt it do you talk of your germany and your france sir do you know that the average number of inhabitants of a house in london is eight and in berlin eighty that the mortality in london is fifteen and in berlin seventeen that the average rent per room in london is so and so and in berlin so and so that in fact that an avalanche of statistics has suddenly descended on you reducing you to abject and humiliated silence never was there such a man for statistics he is a blue book in breeches my brain reels at the thought of a conversation between him and mr chiozza money each bringing up battalions of figures to crush the other millions of figures figures on horseback and figures on foot a perfect armageddon of averages and tables and percentages oliver wendell holmes says that some men lead facts about with them like bulldogs and let them loose upon you at the least provocation john burns's facts are bulldogs that leap at your throat and shake the life out of you and the marvel is that with all this welter of facts his thinking is so clear and his judgment so sound the reason is that he knows life at first hand and by life i mean the life of the common people to whom he belongs and whom he genuinely loves he has worked with them in the engine-room at sea and ashore he has thundered to them on tower hill in hyde park and trafalgar square he has lived among them and never deserted them he is easy in any company but most at ease with them he knows the london of the people as perhaps no other man knows it he has spent and still spends months in tramping its streets 
talking to the people talking to the policemen dipping into sunless alleys peering into back yards this vast metropolis is like an open book to him it is as though he could not only name the streets but could tell you the story of the people in the houses and the contents of the kitchen pot this insatiable thirst pursues him abroad he goes to germany sees its sewers and its sanctuaries marches with its army talks with the cabmen in the street comes back laden with invisible imports of precious facts more bulldogs for the unwary he is probably the best-known man in the country certainly the best-known man in london for which he has done magnificent service as the embodiment and the driving force of the progressive movement popular enthusiasm has dowered him with the properties of his namesake some one was declaiming at a meeting that a man's a man for all that adding as burns says whereat the audience rose with cheers for good old john and he dominates his enemies as much as his friends in a bus during the last l c c election two moderates were discussing the wastrels look at the poor law said one costs four million a year nice pickings there yes says the other i wonder what john burns share is one million sterling sir thundered a voice from the other end and the menacing eye of john burns gleamed over the paper he had been reading unseen living ever in the crowd ready ever to cross swords with whomsoever will his life is full of comedy and episode adventure dogs him as it did the knights of old he is always snatching children from the eminent deadly hoof or plunging into the river or stopping runaway horses or carrying accidents to the hospital members never fall ill in the house except when john burns is there to carry them out and at fires he is sublime his voice frightens the flames into miserable surrender his honesty is above suspicion money cannot buy him threats cannot coerce him for eighteen years he was the mainstay of the government of london a working engineer living upon his grant of two hundred pounds from his society and never a breath of suspicion against his honour no job could abide his wrath a battersea official told me that one was contemplated in his department of the borough he went to burns and told him in five minutes he was away on his bicycle like the wind by noon he had smashed the intrigue such passion for the public interest is magnificent think of it beside the appalling municipal corruption of america think what such an example means to us not only in cash but in the wholesome ideals of citizenship see too how he is cleansing the augean stables of poor law administration his claims as a legislator on the grand scale yet remain to be proved but as an administrator he is worth millions to us like sir anthony absolute no one is more easily led when he has his own way you cannot argue with him any more than you can argue with a sledge-hammer he has no subtleties either of thought or of conduct he is plain as a pike-staff what is in his mind must out and if he doesn't understand a thing he damns it he has no secrets and no cunning and when he is attacked he hits back with his fist his oratory has never lost the fortissimo of his trafalgar square days but he loves the finery of words words of wondrous length and thundering sounds words in full-bottomed wigs and court dress he would have felt that johnson was strangely feeble when he said that something had not wit enough to keep it sweet but he would have forgiven the great man when he corrected himself and said it has not vitality enough to preserve it from putrefaction that is the sort of verbal thunderbolt mr burns hurls at you when he has time to think yet like johnson his first impulse is to express himself in brief emphatic saxon and homely imagery of which he has an abundance sir speaking of two young politicians of cold exterior sir the only difference between them is that one is strawberry and the other vanilla they're both ices and of an acrid person who is reported to be suffering from stomach trouble what can you expect of a man who has drunk nothing but vinegar for forty years 
but when he has so to speak time to dress he is a verbal aristocrat his adjectives march in triplets and his sentiments in antithesis as though he belonged to the eighteenth century instead of the twentieth he is more proud of his library of six thousand books than of his place in the cabinet and would rather be caught by the photographer while reading a book on the pavement outside a second-hand bookshop in charing cross road than when coming from a levee in court costume not that he has any objection to velvet coats knee breeches and shoe buckles privately i think he knows they suit him as well as the bowler hat and the reefer jacket that he wears on all other occasions as the sign of democracy his emotions are primal and are exhibited with entire candour he has strong hates and strong affections and expresses both with the frankness of a primitive nature a noble sentiment well expressed delights him as a brightly coloured picture delights a child and the sergeant who when a gun carriage had overturned in some manoeuvres on salisbury plain and mr burns had helped to extricate the men said in reply to his inquiry as to whether any one was hurt the men of the royal artillery are sometimes killed but never hurt captured his heart for ever the truth is that he is a victim of phrases if he may make the phrases he does not care who makes the bills and to be just to him he has probably said more witty things than any man in politics it is not necessary even if it were possible to allocate the blame for the bitterness that has sprung up between him and the labour party at the root i think in spite of tower hill and trafalgar square he was always something of an individualist and a bureaucrat but whatever the merits of the quarrel he has certainly given knox as hard as those he received and at least no reminder of the past ever puts him to silence or to the blush when some one at a meeting recalled his saying of other days that no man was worth more than five hundred pounds a year and contrasted that saying with his present salary he answered with stentorian good humour sir i am a trade unionist the trade union wage for cabinet ministers is two thousand pounds a year would you have me a blackleg he had his foibles he is himself the most interesting man he knows he sees himself colossal a figure touching the skies he walks round himself as it were and he is filled with admiration at the spectacle wonderful what a man it is the egotism of the child so frank so irresistible so essentially void of offence so ready to laugh at itself there is a story ben trovato perhaps that when sir h campbell bannerman offered him a seat in the cabinet he bowed himself out with the remark well sir henry this is the most popular thing you have done it is a story good enough to be true it sums up so admirably the amiable weakness of this robust man withal what an asset he is to our national life what a breeze he brings with him what wholesome fresh air what unconquerable buoyancy i am told that he is less popular in battersea than he was then so much the worse for battersea if it has ceased to follow him it has ceased to follow an honest man and a great citizen he has fallen away from grace in the eyes of the labour party who find the accents of the treasury bench different from those of tower hill and so they are so they must be but in spite of a certain stiffening as it were of the muscles of the mind his heart beats true as ever to his first and only love the common people he chastises them but he loves them not with the aloofness of a superior person but with the love of a comrade who offers them a shining example if he will only check the tendency to intellectual hardening which some of us observe guard against the subtle advances of the official spirit suspect the flatterer and occasionally listen to old friends who will not flatter he has a long career of service to the people before him but when all is said one cannot resist the conclusion that john burns true vocation is not that of a minister but of a challenger and that public life has lost far more than it has gained by harnessing him to office i would rather hear him in hyde park 
his great voice booming across to the palaces of park lane his huge fist shaking defiance at social wrong than hear him trying to modulate his accents to the restraints of office from the treasury bench he was a more heroic figure when he burst as cluellen smith and von nash have described into the arena of the great dock strike than he is to-day and it is better to think of him scaling the front of the local government board office determined to be heard by the authorities within even though he had to be heard through the windows than to think of him sitting inside and securing a kcb for the official who tried to sweep him from the window-sill in the old rebellious days he is the greatest voice and the greatest personality the people have produced in our time and he should have remained a free voice as a statesman there are plenty to eclipse him for he has little constructive genius and no gift for the manipulation of men but as a citizen he has had no rival End of chapter thirty five